do it. I'm going to go on the voice and I'm going to be successful. And she's like, no, you're not. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z and I'm joined online today by a special guest, someone that you've already seen on the podcast. Uh, Last time we had him on, we were actually in Oregon uh, at UTV Takeover and we actually had a few different guys on the podcast along with him. So uh, today we're going to actually have a one-on-one with uh, Russell Porter from Buggy Whips. How you doing, bud? Good, man. How are you? It's great to see you again. Yeah, no, not not too great weather out where I'm at. It's kind of all frozen and, and nasty and gray out, but I'm sure it's a little bit better where you're at. It's a little wet today, but I mean, it, we had some light drizzle overnight, but it's probably going to be 70 and sunny today. So it's off to a good start. <laughs> so let's remind everybody kind of uh, we'll just do a kind of a, a recap of who you are, what Buggy Whippus is, where you're at and all that. And then we'll get into the rest of the show. But uh, yeah, tell us where you're at and uh, where what office you're in right now. Uh, I'm in my office here in San Diego. Uh, my name is Russ and I'm one of the grandsons to the founder of Buggy Whip. And in 2015, I took it over and we create and manufacture and produce safety products that go on everything from off-road to racing to mining, construction, military, anything that needs to be visible and be seen, we make a product for it. And I think it's interesting uh, that that's how you said it. You make safety products uh, for various industries. And we're going to get into that a little bit, I think. Um, But uh, you're Southern California. Uh, How long have you been actually working? I mean, you're saying you're the grandson of of this company. Uh, How long have you actually been involved with Buggy Whip? Since I was born. (laughs) (laughs) I I grew up here. Uh, Honestly, I grew up. Um, I since the day I was born, probably a week later, I was at the shop. Uh, My mom worked for my grandparents for years and worked her way all the way through the company. She knows everything there is to know here. And so I grew up here as a kid, walked, went all the way through it, was at the shop every day, worked with my grandparents and grandfather and everybody that made this company go for years till eventually I took it over. So back then, what was mom doing? Uh, My mom did everything. I mean, she started out assembling parts for him and then moved all the way up into uh, sales and then vice president and then managing it and just running the whole thing. So she knew how to build everything, how to run it. Um, where you went with it, all the customers, customer service. She did all of it throughout the years of working here. So mom did a lot of jobs and wore a lot of hats there. What, what was the other family's involvement with the company? Uh, really, truthfully, it was my, as far as family is concerned, my my grandparents started it. My grandfather actually started it. It's a, he's a probably, if not the most intelligent man I've ever met in my life. Uh, the guy was an absolute genius and a creator and ran multiple companies and multiple things throughout his life. Um, And as far as family goes, it was actually only myself, my mom, and then one of his, and his only daughter worked for him periodically throughout the years. Um, She would, she had some other stuff that she did. She did banking for a long time, but then she came back and worked for him for many, many, many years. Uh, So for the most part, it was a family affair. Most everybody had some sort of tie into the company. When, at what point did like, grandpa and and family kind of step away and and you guys kind of started seeing the idea that you're going to jump into these roles um you know truthfully i worked probably for since the early 2000s with him really side by side understanding it knowing what it was um and really where do we go what do we do with the company we are the original guys i mean we built fiberglass we designed the whole concept of safety and antennas and that's where we came from. And so in 2010, when you started seeing LEDs come out, LED lighting come out, the issue that we always had with going down that path was we're known for products not failing ever, like not having an issue, not cracking, not breaking. I mean, going so extensive on what we do as far as the research behind it, that to jump into where everything was just didn't fit our objective at the end of the day to really make a product that was safety. I mean, it's it's easy to get caught up in these new things and cool things and go, man, we got to do that because it's going to create sales and drive revenue and it's going to keep us fresh. But if you build a product and release the product and the product fails, it does nothing but hurt your reputation and frankly, at the end of the day, a near miss is only a near miss because it was a near miss. 
I mean, how many times do things happen in life? Maybe you're driving through an intersection and a car catches you at the last minute, and slams on the brakes where they would have ran the lead light and you don't even know it. You just continue about your daily life. So when you think about whips and safety and what goes behind it, what you have to think about is how many near misses do you have, no matter what the industry you're in is. And potentially if our product fails, that near miss becomes a tragedy. And it doesn't matter what it costs at the end of the day to have one tragedy is one too many. And so for us, it was really stick on the path that we were, go back to engineering. And then um, my grandfather ran the company up actually until the day he passed away. He passed away on Monday morning. Um, and then I took over shortly thereafter. We had a big meeting and there. It was like, you know, you're the guy that understands this. You know where we want to go. You worked with them one on one and let's do it. And so we from that moment went into creating our current LED product. And that took us years of development to get it to where it's at now. So I think it's interesting uh, to kind of look back at the history of the product development. Um, You're saying before LED whips were a thing, you guys were creating safety whips for the marketplace, not just for off-road because that's not for UTVs and side-by-sides because you were making stuff for different industries. Kind of give us the idea behind some of those products in the early days of um, you know, what existed before and what development happened before you guys jumped into the LEDs. Um, so before whips, there really was nothing. And, and when you get out of off-road and you get into mining, your equipment is 10X, 20X. It's massive in its size. So you can have earth movers that are 128 feet long, 68 feet wide, over 25 feet tall. They'll run over a Ford F-350, a Ford F-450, like it's a speed bump. They won't even see it. And so if you don't have something to be visible to keep that height, so the, the theory behind it was you take a you take a fiberglass shaft that will withstand whatever you can throw at it, and you put that shaft on a smaller vehicle, and then what happens is as the earth movers move about the job sites, what they can see is they see the flag. They may not necessarily see the vehicle, but they see the flag. And what's actually pretty amazing is, it, 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 I hate to say it, but it kind of goes back to KISS, right? Keep it simple, stupid. And the fact that we've evolved so much in technology. We just got back from Mine Expo in 2021. And more and more equipment is going to like drones and like predator spy planes and, and like that stuff where you have the the operators working in a air conditioned facility in a trailer on a job site and all the equipment is ran with computers right because the more you can keep the driver out of the vehicle the safer everybody becomes but even as technology has increased and grown and you've now got 20 30 50 60 cameras on these rigs watching everything they still use whips they still use our product every day to keep people safe. It, it was just on a mine site six months ago and it, an accident happened. It backed over. It just didn't see it. The camera was out of line of sight. And it missed it. So sometimes the simplest product that's just well designed works phenomenal for that industry. So that's where it came from was build a product that will withstand anything. And it, it, off-road seems tough until you get on a hall road or a mine site <laughs> and off-road becomes, you're like, wow, this isn't that bad. It's rough. It's dirty. It's, it's all those elements come into it. And you think about mining as an industry globally, we work in one atmosphere, right? If it's 90 degrees, the desert's vacant. Nobody wants to be out there. And if it's 60, everybody's like, oh God, it's so cold. Let's go in the RV, <laughs> right? We're, we're this moderate temperature. But when you get outside of that and you think about mining, you're talking about Northern territory. Yeah. I mean, negative 50, 60 degrees Celsius. You're talking in the scorches of Australia. I mean, it, it, it's so drastic weather conditions. They work all the time. And so you have to build something that will withstand in that, that withstands the freezing, but also withstands the hot. So when we're talking about that kind of conditions and just to inject, I've always dreamed of racing a side by side in a mine. So if that opportunity ever happens where you're at on site, and you're like, Hey, I have this guy that wants to come down. Is that okay? Let me know. Well, well I want to make that happen, but uh, we'll see what we can put together <laughs> the, the, uh, the idea of something that's not going to fail and not going to break and, and going to survive all these conditions. What was kind of some of the process into the development of 
as something as simple as a fiberglass rod, like what kind of development goes into that to make it a dependable product and not just something you buy from China? Well, you think about fiberglass as, as a basic hole, right? It's it's composite, it's weaves, it's structures of pieces put together. But you can take a fiberglass rod and change its diameter by five thousands and change how fast it cracks by a hundred X. So five, one, ten thousands can change it. So we started out by finding th- there's pieces to um, fiberglass as well, as far as like there's coating. So, you know, you, you use the example, but like every, not all cars are created equal just because it's a car doesn't mean that it's the same car. A Ferrari and a Hyundai are different, right? They, they're both cars, but they're different. Fiberglass is the same way. When you think about fiberglass to really get everybody to understand it, think about fishing poles. Fishing poles are fiberglass. That's their base structure, right? And you think about where that shaft starts and where it goes to. It starts out at a fairly large diameter and goes down to this very small diameter. And then you think about the string and the pressure and the amount of weight that is on that to pull a fish or a whale or whatever it is that, not a whale, I guess, but you get where I'm going. (laughs) I was trying to think of of a big fish like you know tuna or something, not a whale. <laughs> Go on, Moby Dick here. Yeah, 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 not that. But uh, but you think about the you think about a fishing pole and how much design goes into a fishing pole to have that fishing pole flex all the way and not break. Right, that same concept and same theory. Not all fishing poles are created. Not all glass is created. So we started out by looking at every piece of it the resins that we use the fiberglass that we use its strength how it tapers where it tapers the height that we can get out of it all these pieces i mean we strand our own wire we don't even buy wire off the shelf we don't buy anything every piece of it is thought out and designed and built and streamlined to work together you just said you strain your own wire so just for the record everybody listening to this podcast literally every single manufacturer gets their wire from China. So that's an amazing feat in its own uh, that you have that kind of uh, intensity in your product um, sourcing. Yeah, we we do not our uh, we do everything to make the product in the United States and the wire comes from the United States. It's stranded. There's particular copper we buy, then that copper gets stranded. The insulation is custom made to withstand certain variables. I mean, we don't buy anything off the shelf. And I go back to the story and I say this very wholeheartedly. There's, we got a story once from, from somebody that bought our product. And and the the thing is, you never know where the product's going to be used, right? All the time when we first came out this product, they're like, well, why do you do that? It doesn't matter that it works at negative 55 degrees Celsius or works at 1540 degrees F. Glamis isn't that way, right? But Glamis is one entity of it. And it goes back to that being safe no matter what. And so we had a customer that had it and got caught in a snowstorm and her their vehicle eventually broke and they had somebody, they don't know the distance away, but actually the only thing that was on on the vehicle was the whip. That's the only thing that worked. That's it. Eight foot snow drifts, freezing cold. And the only thing that worked was the whip. And they wrote us this letter and they said, I have a husband today and my son will have a father for the rest of his life because of your product. You know, you, I met you and you talk about all this stuff. It does. And I thought, well, I'm never going to use that until it became something that we use. And I have a husband for the rest of my life. And my son has a father because somebody saw that whip came down and rescued my husband from getting hypothermia on the car. I mean, those are the kind of things that when we think about it, when we build it, that's what we're trying to do. I mean, I just, I, I, I have, a, I've learned to let some of my nitpickiness go, but I am very anal about a product never failing as it, you just can't, it, it could be somebody's life on the other end of it. And I think if you've ever had a discussion with Russ, you know exactly what he's talking about on on being so specific on things. Um, and and so the safety aspect of this uh, is super important because I think that um, there are kind of two buyers in the market, in my opinion, we've discussed this before, um, that there's somebody that wants a whip because it looks cool and it makes their car bling and it makes it shiny and stuff like that. Uh, and they totally disregard the idea that it's a safety item. And they might have some inclinations like this lets me ride at night and be seen, but they're not really focused on the safety side of it. And then there's the other guys that are are putting the whips up because they 
want to do everything possible to be seen, whether that be in the daytime, whether that be in the nighttime, whether that be in the trees, whether that be on the dunes, whether that be on a work site. There's this idea that these cars that we're in, whether that be a UTV, a truck, a, a whatever, ultimately there's something that's going to win in an accident, right? Other than the vehicle. And so there's this idea that I'm going to do whatever I can to be safe and keep my family safe in this vehicle. And that includes being seen by other people. So there's some guys that say that they only ride the dunes at night so that they can see the lights coming. There's some guys that say I only ride the trails during the day so that, you know, or at night so I can see the light lights coming around the corner so I don't get head on or something. Um, the whips part of the, the dune experience, the off-road experience, the desert experience, especially in UTV where we're focused is, is super miscalculated by a large number of people. And I think the safety aspect of this is very important to revisit constantly because people don't understand that just because you have an led whip doesn't mean that someone's going to see you just because it's, it's, it's lit up in the middle of the night and you can see a five foot circle around your car doesn't mean somebody else is going to see you. When you're doing dancing lights and you're doing whatever colors and you've hit it through the trees and the top third of the whip doesn't work anymore and effectively cutting your safety factor down and all these different things, you really got to consider the fact that this this thing that you invested money into is more than just a bling item. It's something that's going to save your life when that person can see you over that lip around the corner through the thick, whatever the case may be. Right. I, I 100% agree. I mean, I think... And really, truthfully, the the I got a wake up call on this. Uh, the first sand show we ever did at, at, with the LED whip was back in 2016, and we worked so hard to have the brightest, and you know, it's all stainless on the bottom, and every detail worked out. And I went there going, and, and when people would come up, I would tell them about these features, and and every time we'd hear the same thing over and over and it was from generations that knew about us that were like hey my granddad or my father or whoever had your product and it didn't break and i heard mom and dad father and son mother and daughter come up to me and go you know why i'm happy that you're here is because i know i can buy your product it's going to work and it's going to keep my family safe in the dunes and i kept hearing it over and over and over again and it just opened my eyes to realize that, no, we really at the root of everything, it's all about safety. I mean, to get away from off-road for a second, here's a story and a, a really good friend of mine who I who I thoroughly enjoy. He's a, he's a great guy. He took a chance on us and bought some of our, our shorter two foot whips and he screwed them into the side of his overland vehicle that he takes out and goes hunting and does all the stuff with. And he told me that the reason he did it was to keep his kids safe. And, and I thought to myself, well, what do you mean? I, I don't understand. I, explain this to me. And what he said was, he goes, the reason I put it on the side of my vehicle is that if I take a light, no matter whose brand it is, and I put it on the side, that light shines tremendously far, it puts a ton of output out. So it may shine into somebody else's camp that I don't really need it to shine into. And somebody may be blinded and hit my kids. My kids want to play outside outside the truck or the camper and there's no good light so what i did he took the whips he threaded them into the side he got almost a, about a 50 foot radius of light up down all over didn't intrude on any of his other things and he goes it keeps my family safe i can go out and go camping and know that one somebody's gonna see my rig and not hit me because he actually goes in the middle of nowhere i mean he goes way out there and you start realizing this concept of all these things that are great ideas, but they drive back to safety. Take racing, for instance. I mean, I'll be totally honest. When we first got into racing, I was like, we're going to have to convince somebody that's trying not to be seen. They let's put a whip on a race car. Like this is an out of the box idea. And guess what's happened? We've now have take Mark Burnett who puts him on the top of his chase truck. And now he's like, my guys can see, I can see the pits. I, not only does it save me time in racing because I know exactly where my pit is in the darkest of nights down in Baja, but my guys are safe. Nobody's going to hit my guys because they know where my truck is. They know where I'm at, right? You take Adrian Oriana, you take um, uh, Ken Block that just ran them. You take the Geyser brothers that are running, take all these people that are running whips and they're now going, you take Justin Lofton. There's a video, one of his uh, Ah Beef Lifes and you look at it 
they lost radio communications. Think about that. You're in the middle of desert with no radio communications and they just happen to be candidly filming no indication of anything. He, he didn't ask for sponsorship. He didn't ask for that. He bought the product because he saw the value in it, put it on. And when they were out there, he's trying to come into his pits and the guy's like, how do we know when it's going to be? Where do we know he's at? We don't have radio communications. One guy goes, Oh, look for the whip. That's how we'll know when he's coming and we'll be prepared. So there's, it's branched out into all these new places and places you can use it and safety and all this stuff, but it drives back to safety at the end of the day. It has to be reliable and work when it matters. I think it's interesting, uh, especially in the racing scene and, and some of these other places. And we're seeing lots of guys putting like the two foot whips or, or whatever on the race cars or, you know, where they can't, you know, throw a six foot whip on a, on a race car. You're, you're just going to either, uh, slow down or it's going to be kind of a awkward situation they're putting these shorter whips on there because it literally is giving them identif- identification on the course uh for their team other teams the 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 race series event staff the all these different people can easily identify where a car is especially when you're talking about when like a, a valley gets full of dust or you know stuff like that uh a lot of people uh in the racing know what a chase bar is and they know why a chase bar is important um, the same effect comes in with the whips and it's something that you can have on your car, um, or your campsite or anything where sure. you can break through some of that and become an identifiable point in space where people know that there's going to be something there. Right. And that's right. a huge deal. Um, we went on the, um, the, the BDR trips through Idaho, uh, and it was getting seriously dusty in some areas. The roads weren't bad. The, the terrain wasn't bad, but just us being there created a lot of dust and it created a unsafe condition for ourselves for the people behind the lead and things like whips and chase bars really even the middle of the bright sunny day bluebird day still played a role in the safety factor of our cars and so it's really important for everyone to take kind of an important look at the whole scenario around their experience not just one aspect of it i i agree and as and as Places get busier. I mean, I, I I often say that UTVs are the greatest thing that happen to our sport, right? It, it's the pre-UTV, you had to have something for everything, right? You had to have a Jeep to go rock crawling. You had to have a sand car for Glamish. You had to have a pre-runner for the desert. You had to be rich or you had to have a lot of junky stuff, which was my jam. I had a trailer full of <laughs> garbage and it worked. But I made it work, right? But the UTV single-handedly, I think, not only saved our industry, but brought people from all... uh, This is the greatest thing about... I often talk about Glamis and why it is the greatest place on earth. It is the only place on the earth where you can literally have $10 in your pocket, a guy with a truck sleeping in the bed, and next to him, a multimillionaire or billionaire or a celebrity with so much money, they don't know what to do with it. And the fanciest, nicest cars. And guess what? They're at the same campfire. They're doing the exact same thing. They're in the same sport. This has this sport is the only sport in the world that has opened the opportunity to cut all lines out of life, right? There's no, there's no higher class. There's no, there's no different classes. You're all a group of people doing the same activity. And when you think about that, right across the United States. I mean, you know this from from your show and all the travels you do. We're all the same, right? You go back and maybe they ride in the mud or maybe we we ride in the desert out here, but we're all building the same car. We're all doing it and it's brought so many people into it. Well, as people come in, I think there needs to be, you know, a lot of people say, well, there should be training classes. There should be this. We just need to put an emphasis on these things are important, right? Good seatbelts, good cages, good whips, right? These things that will potentially save your life if an accident happens, right? Mistakes happen. We all have made them in our life. You know, I'm sure every one of us has ran a red light before, missed a turn on the dunes or went in the wrong mud hole, right? And so if we just start pushing focus on getting everybody the right parts to build their vehicle, then we'll be in a place where everybody can enjoy the sport for years to come. I think that's, you know, we've said it multiple times here on the show that this community is special just in the idea that it takes care of itself for the most part. Um, You know, when it comes down to being out and and, and adventuring in these vehicles and doing stuff, you know, you stuck in a hole is the same thing as the other guy stuck in the hole, same as 
the rich guy stuck in the hole, same as the poor guy stuck in the hole. Like we're all in it together. We all support each other. We all pull each other out. We all lend each other parts. We all help each other wrench. Um, and that kind of special attitude in our industry uh, still needs to apply to the education side. Like we need to be saying, you need to know this. So I'm going to be preemptive in letting you know that not in a jerky way, not like, you know, I'm better than you and I'm telling you how to do things in life. It's more like you're going to the dunes for the first time. Let's have a 30 minute conversation about the dunes, just what I've learned, what I've experienced so that you have some sort of gauge of how to approach this new experience. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think, and it's like you said, it's not being a jerk. It's, it's, we, uh, the unfortunate side of things is that the the amazing thing about things is that you can walk in with credit now and buy a vehicle that'll do anything. The downside of that is that most of us that didn't have that opportunity started out on something junky or something that could kill us in a hurry, like a three wheeler, right? Greatest <laughs> toy ever, but it could kill you faster. So you you had a line, you knew that line, so you didn't push it. Now with cage and seats and all this stuff that goes into it, right? That line becomes so invisible that it's not even about somebody wanting to, to not learn. It's just a simple mistake, a simple, your belt breaks while going around a bowl. What do you do? I mean, something as innocent as a belt breaking at the top of a bowl could be catastrophic, right? I mean, right. there's these basic things that that i think we've learned you know from rolling or crashing a quad or a three-wheeler or whatever you're like okay don't do that and then we graduated but now that graduating class is just getting the big stuff which is incredible and it's opening the doors for so many amazing you know opportunities and riders and all this stuff but yeah i think there's i think there's a point where safety has to come back into it and hey this is this is how this works here and this is how we do it and you know you know maybe they have ideas to do something safer as well i was i was intrigued by a conversation i overheard um online the other day where uh being who i am and what i do i was you know snooping around the internet about pro r stuff and uh the there was a guy talking about the fact that this car him and his buddy both ordered them they both got them on the same weekend they both went out riding with them um, and this guy's buddy was like, I'm returning the car. This is too much car for me. Like, I am not going to be safe driving this car. And it was an interesting conversation because we as a community also need to know our limits. And a lot of these guys coming into the community don't know their limits. They don't know that there are limits. And when you buy, you know, this brand new pro R that has amazing suspension, amazing horsepower and all these different things, or you buy a used can Am X three with 400 horsepower tune and like all this other stuff, right? Like you can quickly get into a situation where you're literally thinking about you're going to die. Right. And <laughs> yeah. it, you get a false sense of security with the idea that you're got four strap, you got four point harness, you got a roll cage over you, even if it's an aftermarket cage, right? Like, right you still have the ability to die <laughs> and kill yourself by making a stupid decision or a mistake. And, um, you know, safety goes all around. We're not talking about just being seen. We're talking about your mentality of how you actually approach these cars and how you approach the off-road industry in general. Like when you go out with your family, are you taking the necessary supplies? Are you taking a med kit? Are you taking, are you trained with a med kit? Are you able to facilitate your kid sticking his arm out the window and getting it snapped off on a tree or rolling it over are you able to handle those scenarios or have you even thought about those scenarios? Um, and when we go on like our long trips or if we go out mountain riding or whatever, you know, for the most part, most people are good. They send, they do their hand signals. They do, you know, all that kind of stuff to let you know that what you need to know to be safe. But if you don't know to do that, you're not going to afford them the safety that they deserve as well as every once in a while, we get a dumb peanut out of the group that just wants to be the Mexican jumping bean of, of, utv riders and does something stupid and, and so there's just always a scenario where you may be in a hazardous condition so safety is super important and it's something that i can't stress enough and i'm always talking to people about you know you're talking about upgrades you're talking about wheels and tires and spring kits and all these different things it's like well cool have you thought about what you're investing into your safety aspect fire extinguishers you know recovery kits uh cage design um seat belts and harnesses all these things come into mind and I think more and more so we need to start talking about, like you were saying earlier, the more congested areas get, 
the less visibility you're going to have because things just get snow snow blind, right? In the in the dunes, you can get snow blind. Out on mm-hmm. the trail, you can get snow blind. Um, and and so I think more and more we need to start talking about being seen, not just from the front, but from the side, from the rear. You know, from the top down a mountain. You know, all those different scenarios I think are super important to be talking about. Yeah, and, and frankly, you brought up a great point. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you've been going to the dunes like me since you could you know, a week after you were born or whether you're new, right? We all lose track of when something goes wrong. What do you do? Right. And and a prime example of that is I was in the dunes. We had crashed a Can-Am. I wasn't driving and we went back to fix it. And the side of the car that was in the sand was totally, that was full droop, right? The suspension was out, but the passenger side was still the wheel was still on and i went to pull the shock off to get the car repaired and when i pulled off i cut my finger off the shock tab on the on the because the because the sway bar was still connected just a dumb mistake i've torn that car apart a thousand times i know how to do it just a dumb mistake that happened and when i pulled it out you know cut my finger off here are you saying you actually cut your finger completely off cut a chunk Bro, of it off yeah that's how yeah. that happened yeah yeah it's a shock <laughs> shock tab on a on you're forever committed to the utv scene now you can not, never leave the utv scene you can never be anything else <laughs> it was uh it was an interesting experience i will tell you that much it uh <laughs> but it cut he, here's the amazing thing one of the guys with with me is a retired military had been to multiple wars had knows everything there is to know about how to keep people calm, what to do. Uh, another buddy of mine was is in his 50s, late 50s, he had been doing for, I mean, we had every person that you could imagine with us. And guess what? None of us had a safety kit. Right. What did none of us have? No way to patch it, right? What? Nobody had anything. We're scrambling. We end up finding an oily rag in the back of my <laughs> car to wrap my finger in. And drive me out of the dunes, right? And here's these experienced people that just missed it, right? And, and, you know, I give Adrian, I race with Adrian, I co-drive for him from time to time, and I give him a lot of credit. It may seem stupid, but he sits the team down before every race and goes over how to use the fire extinguisher, how to do this. And it's like, okay, we've done this 30 times this season. Why are we doing it again? But when the scenario happens, that one or two minute scenario that he took to explain something, not being condescending is potentially life-saving when we, you need it because you know things happen and then you go, well, what do we do, right? So I think you bring up this great point about, you know, it's, it's not how long you've been in there, but it can happen to any one of us instantly. And Adrian's a, a, a firefighter, EMT. Uh... Yes daily in in san diego so he's current he's constantly in that environment of you know repair fix rescue do those things um and so for him it's easy to see the idea that everybody needs to remind be reminded every single time we need to go through this consistency thing you know the military trains and what they do their special teams practice what they do every single day of every single week like they're always constantly improving practicing improving practicing learning improving practicing like it's a it's a rep- repetitious thing because in the moment in the knee jerk moment you have to have that subconscious reaction time that's going to either save the situation or save your life or save somebody else's life or or you know just avoid being in that situation altogether and right. and so reminding ourselves constantly about what we're doing what the potential hazards are is super important and being aware of the fact of our limitations, whether that be physical driving experience, whether that be, you know, some people just don't respond to events as quick as others. So they shouldn't be going as fast in certain scenarios as other people. Some people have visual impairments that, uh, you know, would impact their safety uh, qualification. There's some people that literally have health conditions and you should be aware that if you're going to be going into an environment like this, you have to be prepared to to deal with that situation and a lot of times we just think we're going out for a buggy ride it's like not a big deal like i can just jump in the car if something happens we'll just drive back well what if you can't drive back what if somebody's not there to see you roll over what if (laughs) you know your radios bug out out you in the middle of a hole there was a guy um in uh the oregon dunes that he you know the oregon dunes are very hilly there's a lot of forestry involved with the edges of the dunes and things like that 
you know, he had a top of the line car. He had radio systems. He had pumper systems. He had whips. He had everything you could put on a car that would make the car awesome, safe, and all those things. And they went over the dunes. They made a mistake. They slid. It was a little bit steeper than they thought they were doing or whatever. They ended up down in a hole in the trees with a branch going through their side and nobody knew. And the car's comm system went out. Their cell phone flew out of the car. There was no way for them to communicate outside the car. And the only reason they're still alive is because they just happened to have somebody on the other side of the valley see them go down and they came to check on them. And that's the only reason. Like, that is a huge deal. Like, we were in, uh, we were at, in Oregon actually for takeover. Uh, we were out shooting a video with uh, Shreddy and, and Blake and all those guys. And we were done wrapping up. We were going to head back to uh, Vendor Row and, and get back to whatever we were doing. And I happened to see through the trees on a lip of the dunes, a YXZ parallel with the lip of the dune halfway cocked over with a guy standing on a tire to keep it from rolling with another guy in the car trying to back (laughs) it out and it was like those guys were not prepared for that situation and they were in a bad spot and they needed someone to come help them and it wasn't for any other reason other than i saw them from across the valley and recognized the situation that we went and stopped and helped them get out and that's luck that is not that is not them being prepared that's not me being prepared that's just luck. And a lot of times we can't rely on luck to keep us safe. I mean, nobody should be relying on luck to keep you safe. There's a, <laughs> there's a, there's a certain aspect of our sport that there's a lot of that kind of uh, adrenaline rush from riding that lucky line, right? right. That's part of the, the appeal that we have in the dunes. That's part of the appeal we have in desert racing, riding that adrenaline line. But there's a lot of that that comes down to preparedness, not luck. And I think a lot of people forget that. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think I, I think there's a couple of things. I think one of the points that you make, right, is that we're all there to help each other, right? So when you see a situation, everybody comes together. And, and it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, we all come together. I think one of the things, I don't want to say it bothers me, but I, I think we nowadays we have so many, you know, internet warriors that want to say things about situations. To me, it, the cool thing about where we're at now is that you can start as a kid writing, right? So I think we need to take a step back before we say something about any individual, right? Young or old, male or female, about a situation that happened and think, what is their skill level, right? Just because you've been doing something a hundred years doesn't make you good at it. And just be- because you've been doing something one day doesn't make you bad at it, right? How many people, I mean, prime example, how many people have tried to accomplish what Seth Quintero just did? No kidding. I I mean, your age has nothing to do with your skill level. Your ability has nothing to do with anything other than your talent, right? And so all the time you see an accident happen or something happen, everybody instantly jumps on and throws their two cents in it instead of saying, wait a second. We don't know what the situation was. You can be the best athlete in the world and have something go wrong. And you can be Joe off of the street corner in the first time in a UTV and have everything go right, right? It it doesn't matter at the end of the day, but we need to, I think, take a step back and understand that everybody's skill level is different and every situation is different and things happen. They just do in life. That's the reality of it. Yeah, it's super important to not judge each other and and judge, you know, a a driver by his car or by, you know, whatever the case may be. There's some guys that, you know, they have a $100,000 UTV and they literally never get out of 4,000 RPM. So it's like, (laughs) it's like you can't judge people on that and you can't judge their skill level. And, And there's been times where I've been guilty of it, where it's like, I see somebody with all the equipment, with all the money in the car, with what looks like to be experience marks on the car, things like that, right? And so we have some kind of like a blind trust in that, right? Like we say, they know what they're doing. They've been there. They can help me if I have a problem, right? And then all of a sudden that car blows a piston and they're out of the game. Like, or or the time comes to, to rely on that person and they're standing back with a beer in their hand with their cell phone making a TikTok. It's like, you can't judge a person by what they have or what they look like. You know, we've always said that don't judge a book by its cover. But in the off-road scene, we are a community of guys that like to make sure that we can do things, that we can help each other. 
And part of that extends out to the rest of the community and we should be prepared for that. We should be practicing our belt changes. We should make sure that we know how to make judge our right. clutches or we should know what the signs of a bad axle are. We should know, you know, if, if a wheel is going cockeyed that, you know, maybe the wheel bearing is about to go out and if they go to do another <laughs> carve on the dune that they might be rolling down the hill when they're, when they right. do that. Right. Like, you know, and, and not be afraid to be like, Hey, Hey, let's take two seconds to check that real quick. You know, I've done that before. I right. was at a race, a sand drags race, and a very prominent racer has a very high horsepower car. The wheels come off the ground every time they launch. Like it, it's a, it was a big person that knows what they're doing, right? Like they have a lot of money, a lot of time. This is their career. This is what they do. And I was shooting it and I could show, and I looked back at the video footage in slow-mo and I could see that their wheel was doing this in the middle of their, they, of their race, you know, takeoff. So right. It was like, hey, I took the time. I walked over. I said, hey, I want you to check this out. Check this video out. I want you to look at this tire. And he goes, oh, yeah, it looks like my wheel bearing's going out. If that would have went out in the middle of a 400 horsepower race, right, and he comes off of that wheelie and slams down, he could have taken a beeline straight to the audience, right? Like, he could have taken right. a beeline straight across the racetrack to the other car. Right. It, it's those situations where we as a community need to look out for each other, but we can't do that unless we're learning along the way. So it's super important to be absorb a sponge and absorb everything and watch everything and, and learn everything and start to recognize where the BS is and start to talk, recognize where the real safety things are to recognize where, you know, someone's product message to bring it back full circle is, is that we need to be educated to know that a product is or isn't what it says to be and to recognize the differences between them. When somebody says, here's a custom roll cage for your car, is it 120 wall? Is it? one and three quarter, two inch? Is it, you know, what are the, are beyond just what you're telling me what it is, what are the information, specific pieces of information that let me know that that's actually what it's going to do in practice when I put it on my car? Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. I think, I think there's, that's one of the wonderful things about this industry, right? Is that at the end of the day, everybody is in this industry because they love it and they want to create parts for it. And there's been amazing companies that have come from, you know, oh, this is my hobby. And I started creating this and 10 people asked me for it. Now we're creating this, right? I think there's this absolute fantasticness about that. But just because somebody says it something doesn't necessarily make it that way, right? And at the end of the day, what's your time worth, right? If, if I asked you to come mow my lawn today, how much would you charge me? Right. Everybody can say, oh, I offer a warranty or I do this or we back our product or we do this. Okay. But if the product fails, separate and apart from the fact of getting it replaced, if the product fails when you need it, is that your time? Is that your wife? Is that your kids? Is somebody going to get hurt? Right. I, I mean, I think I think there's more thought that needs to go into products and what you purchase when you purchase it. Right. I mean, I it, we get this all the time, and I'll bring this point up, but we get all the time. Do you offer a lifetime warranty? Our competitors offer a from what I understand, and I've not asked them directly, but from what I understand from our customers offer a unconditional lifetime warranty, no matter what. Think about that though. If you have the ability to offer an unconditional lifetime warranty, what does that mean? How much is that product costing in order for you to offer an unconditional lifetime warranty? You know, what, what are you getting with that warranty, right? And then what's your time worth? If that product breaks and you have to send it back and it was an hour to pull off your car, does that cost you $50? That's $50. That's time is the only thing in this world that we can't get back. I can't go buy more of it. I can't get another minute with my wife or my kids or my family. That's it. That time when it's gone, it's gone. And so don't get me wrong. Every product can fail, but if somebody's offering you a unlimited lifetime warranty or saying, Hey, we'll take care of if there's an issue. I will take care of it. It's a manufacturer's issue, but where does that line start to cross where you start to think, okay, what am I really getting for this? Right. Instead of just looking at, Hey, if something goes wrong, I'll get another one. No, no. What are you getting by that? If that makes sense in a way. Yeah. It's, it's super important because I was just looking at a, at a Facebook thread the other day on one of the Facebook groups and, and it, he was dealing with a competing product of yours. And, you know, a lot of people were like, you know, cause somebody had posted, the idea that, hey, these broke, what should I replace it with? Or, you know, what should I do or whatever? And the follow up thread on that was super deep of people saying it, it, either two camps, right? Like they were in this camp of saying, well, 
we bought it because it has this un, unlimited warranty. I can just send it back. I can thrash it in the mountains or on the dunes or whatever. Send it back. They'll send me new ones or whatever. Um, and then the other side of the camp was, why would we waste our time doing that? Like, I just want it to work and be reliable. And and then that goes back into the conversation of why is it even there? Why is the whip even there? And and, and if we're talking about safety, like we have for the last half hour, the the idea of safety is it has to be there to keep you safe. If it's not right. there, it's not keeping you safe. I was right. in the dunes with, um, and I keep talking about dunes and for all my mountain guys and East Coast guys, I'm sorry. But anyways, the, the I have a lot of stories there. So we were in the dunes, a lot of people out riding and their whips failed, right? The wiring shorted out or the controller burnt out, cheap Chinese chipboard blew out or whatever. And they're like, oh, we're fine. we got headlights. We'll, they can see us. I mean, I got the whip there. Like, if the cops pull us over, we'll still we'll just be like, hey, it stopped working. Like, whatever. Well, you're not safe anymore. And and so are you really willing to risk your life and your family's life or whoever's with you or even just the other car uh, and whoever's in that car? Are you willing to risk that just because you wanted to save a buck or you wanted to, you know, not invest as heavily into your safety as maybe some other people do with with higher end products. And so going back to that thread, this one guy was like, you know, hey, I I bought these. I put so much dollars into this because I got two whips set and I everything synchronized and they do the dancey thing and they do they integrate with my stereo system and all this other stuff. He's like, but I replace them every month and I'm sick of it. Like I've done this four times now. I I I'm done putting up with it and I want the best of the best. What is it? Right. No, I, I understand that. And, and I think that that's, that's the heart of it, right? Is that we, you, it goes back to the near miss thing, right? Whips are a near miss incident, right? They are. Somebody saw your whips that you'll never know saw them, and that potentially saves your life, right? So you might have a hundred near misses in your life and not know of one of them and go, why did I spend money on this product? It never saved my life. Well, do you know if it saved your life? Because you can't count all those seconds that somebody may or may not have seen you. We get this question all the time, right? Why don't you guys make it in black? And from a cool factor and an understanding factor, I'm a hundred percent that a black whip is incredible. However, it doesn't reflect the light. It absorbs the light, right? So you take something that you're trying to make bright, that you're trying to make visible, that you're trying to have multi-purpose, and now you close it down, right? And, and this brings up another question we get all the time is, do you guys sell day whips, right? I, I don't understand this word or the concept. And what I mean by that is, is that do we sell a whip that doesn't light up that is a fiberglass pole? Yeah, we created it. <laughs> <laughs> five years ago yeah we sell that it is a standard fiberglass whip yeah a day whip but what is a day whip aren't you buying a whip to be visible like the whole point is why don't we make something bright enough that was our thinking behind it when we went into building whips i wanted something that was so bright that you could see it day or night it didn't matter the condition right that 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 was going to keep you visible so that's where we started our baseline and then we started getting calls going well do you sell a day whip and i'm like why sell a day whip and, and you get a variety so i'm not saying any one manufacturer says this to the customer but you get customers that go why well, ride harder during the day and i don't want to break my whip okay but our whip isn't going to break so what do you mean well yeah but my my our competitors that i bought somebody else's whip whoever it is and there's breaks so I ride slower at night. So that's when I run it at night. Okay. So you're, you don't want to spend the money to buy a product that will work no matter what all the time, but you want to buy two whips. So you're going to buy a day whip and a nighttime whip. But when you add that cost up of those two whips, you end up paying more than what you would have for one whip that works all the time. So I, I've missed the concept. I don't mean to offend anybody. I just have always missed the concept in day whips that you should have a whip that will run any size flag, no matter what all the time and keep you safe and visible. And when you get away from off-road again, and you get into mining. We just spent a, a couple of weeks down at a mine filming for them and they run what off-road would consider a day whip. And they wanted us to do a video and we did an entire video series and shot for an entire day 
the day whip on everything. And then we did an entire video series on the LED whip and shot it for a day. And they came back and said, okay, we're getting rid of all of our day whips immediately. They go, I, we couldn't see it. We couldn't see it 90% of the time. What was the point of it being there? Exactly. There's a, there's a lot that goes into picking, you know, the tool for the moment. There's a lot of people that are going out to the dunes and they just need a, they're in a new place or whatever, and they require a whip at a certain height. So they just go to the local ATV shop, UTV shop, whatever, and buy whatever fiberglass poles in the bucket for 25 sure. bucks or whatever. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing. But, but at the same time, you know, if we're looking at a long-term investment, right, you're not, you're not going to buy just a, you're not going to rely on the factory cage. You're not going to rely on the factory, whatever, uh, three point seat belt to keep you safe if you want to do stuff. So you're going to put a long-term investment of upgrading certain things. So if you're thinking about being visible, being seen, yeah, you can get the the twenty five dollar fiberglass whip at the local shop. That's not a problem, and I and I fully support the local shop to make their money and and to do that. And and no one's gonna drop several hundred dollars on whips in the moment and do a full electrical install and all these different things. There's a reason they exist, and there's a reason they're there, and at the price point they are. But if we're looking at actually creating a long term solution, we really have to think about the quality, the 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 mounting mechanisms, the wiring, the the reliability of the electronics, the light output, and 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 you said something pretty uh, interesting about you know being seen during the day, and we've we've talked about being seen already, but coming off this last year of all these different events that I went to, having a camera in my hand and and doing all these things, um, I found it really interesting that everybody that was running a buggy whip and they had it turned on. Literally, they just they popped on my camera like they would just they stood out in the camera, right? Like you could take a picture of a thousand people in UTVs in a big crowd and you could pick out every single buggy whip, right? And and I'm not saying I'm not trying to like amp you guys up or anything, but the point is in in that scenario, you can identify the reason why the investment and time went into making them the brightest to make them the 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 thing that gets seen right like you can identify that car that person that whatever and so i think it's just super important that we recognize that there are other products in the market that do the same thing but they don't do it for the same reasons and at the same level and i think it's super important to understand the quality of certain products that you buy there's a reason they cost us so much. I mean, yes, there's a business to be had and you need to make money and all that stuff. So there's there's margin there. We understand that. But there's also a lot of investment that goes into a top shelf product. There's a lot of time and man hours that go into a top shelf product. So um, we forget that a lot of times. A lot of times we just go on Amazon, we buy the $25 light bar, we buy the you know $50 harness set, You know, not even for one, just a set. Right. Um, it, it We got to get it past this idea of like you mentioned earlier about the affordability of our sport and people being able to buy these on credit and get into it at a low price level, right? We got to get away from the poor man's attitude of getting into something expensive cheaply and staying there, right? <laughs> we can't stay at that mindset. We got to understand this is a easy sport to get into nowadays if you can find a car. Um, but we got to get away from that poor man mindset. We got to get into the understanding what the sport is and, and the complications that come with it and realizing we need to put our best effort forward to make sure everyone stays safe. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. And I think I understand, right? We've all been there, myself included, where you had to rub two pennies together to get to the dunes, right? So I understand that. But I think, I think to your point is that there's, there's that good, better, best that everybody talks about, right? And, and sometimes those really start to look at a product before you say, this is the product for me, right? Maybe you need a, a, a whip real quick. We'll use that just because we're in talking about whips. So you go out and you buy your $20 whip to go to the dunes. There's nothing wrong with that. And, I, and we, we fully support all of that. But when you take that next step and you start looking at it, not all things are created equal. And, and it, you talk about lights. I, I remember the first time I am a huge fanatic of Baja designs. I have been for years. They're just, in my opinion, the best company out there. And 
I remember the first time I ran a set of Baja designs and I had a 10 inch light bar and I had, a, I had always done the cheap thing before because it's all the money I had. And I, you know, remember back in the day they had the eight inch LEDs at Cragen or a, a hydrogen that you could buy at Cragen, you know, HIDs. And it was like, Oh, baby Jesus, this is, this is the spot, man. And you put those things on. It was like, wow. Then I put a 10 inch Baja designs light bar on and it was brighter than eight of those other lights. And I thought, why did I go and spend all this money and all this time wiring and messing around with this when this one light is brighter than all of this combined, right? And I'm like, I wish somebody would have just sat me down and said, hey, I know this is a little bit more expensive, but don't buy eight of these, buy one of these and you'll find it works 10 times better. And I, 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 I've, that's always stuck in my head. And I've always, since that point, will never at this point leave Baja because I'm always impressed by just how much light output they can do, right? And, and so to your point, I, I understand when we don't have money, but I think you have to look at every aspect of that and say, okay, what am I going to do so that I can build this part that I want to build, right? And I, I think, I think to your point, a lot of times we get caught up in, well, this looks really cool, so I'm going to do it. But how many this literally looks cool do you get back and you go, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish I would have spent the money on these Evolution Power Sports parts or whatever it was to get it to where it needed to be. I think it's it, it's definitely a, a consideration that too many of us forget. We get caught up in, in you know, I want to buy a bunch of stuff, so I have to buy a, everything cheaply so I can get all of them at once, right? Like, we got to get just past that that whole concept and, and just start you know, knocking these things out one at a time. Yeah. I'm going to save up for a cage. I'm going to save up for, you know, better doors, you know, not right. having open doors, like better harnesses. Um, you know, and, and, you know, some people I know that are really penny pinching are I'll buy the front two harnesses and then I'll buy the back two harnesses. Well, how about you buy all four harnesses for the whole family and you wait to go riding until you have all four. Like there's, it just doesn't make sense to me that you would buy one thing for some people not for the other people and and consider them valuable different right like it's just kind of a weird mindset we got to get past that and and i think that follows through all all the entire industry just making sure that we're not compromising where it matters and so i i I agree with that yeah so talking about that um just the nerd in me wants to kind of talk about we've been talking about safety for so (laughs) long here the nerd in me wants to talk a little bit about your product um because I think you've gained from me over our conversations. Like I'm really into like what makes this work. Why is it that way? Like, like I'm super interested. So sure. We've talked a little bit about the fiberglass poles. So the fiberglass poles is not your average off the shelf, China bulk order, send it over the water type fiberglass pole. No, it's and, all handmade or and, made on a machine, but <laughs> I was going to say, wow, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, no. you, you hired out all the surfboard shops to, to start yeah. making your poles. Yeah, um, spinning them by hand, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's talk beyond that. Now we're talking about mounting, right? Like, or, or let's, right. let's before we can get to mounting, the chips on the LEDs, right? We're talking about light output. We're talking about converting electricity to energy in the form of light output, right? And right. for for the most part, everybody uses the same bulk led strips and then they go like oh we got our name on them so then that means that we make them right like you didn't make the led strip you just had somebody put your branding on it right like that's sure that's nothing special so so what's the difference between an like there's competitors there's whatevers that say we have the brightest we have the whatever and for the most part none of them are true they're all just the same chips um and i'm not trying to dog on any brand or any one specific company or anything like that the reality of it is all of those LED chips come from China and they all come from like two or three where manufacturing facilities and they're all pretty much spec the same because they make billions of these chips at a time. Right. And what differentiates your high output LEDs? And you just came out with uh, a year ago or whatever, like a even brighter set of whips that right. have like kind of an overdrive mode or whatever. Like what differentiates right. a LED chip that puts out high output? And I, and I think some of this includes being a single color versus multicolor. But let, I'll let you explain sure. it and and what the differences there are. We we spent uh, nearly three years doing research on LEDs and LED chips and where they come from and how they work and all of that. And when we built our LED chips, we designed 
every inch of it, the board, the chip, how it lays out, the thickness of it, how much copper is used, how it cools, the tape in which we use, how it's glued down, how it's stuck. All these are factors of LED chips. And when I first started with LED chips, I mean, I found articles from my grandfather back in the early 80s where he was designing LED boards and chips himself back before anybody was even talking about it. So our history with this subject is very, very, very long and many, many years. But we sat down and we looked at it and it's amazing how much they're not the same, how much it's not equal, right? The chip design, how it lays out, how much solder you use, so the copper. And I don't want to give away all those <laughs> all your secrets. You, but every inch of the product is thought about. So you can't actually go and buy any one piece of our product off the shelf. None of it. Our outer coating, for example, is 100% made for us. You can't buy it. There is nowhere to get it. It was custom built, custom formulated, and manufactured for this specific use. There's um, how much of this I can say. I don't know. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tread very lightly in this subject because we have some NDAs that we can't for sure. pass on this subject. But when we started out in, in design of our outer coating, we contacted the companies in which that coating is manufactured. They're all here in the States. And we asked them to, we wanted something that was UV resistant. Like we wanted something that nobody else in the world had. And we got told no, <laughs> like, not like, no, like, dude, that doesn't exist. You should just stop it. And it took us finally finding somebody in meetings and NDAs to finally get to that point. And because of the design of that outer coating, which was years in design and development and all around the world to get the components of it, there is actually a division dedicated now at a couple of these plants where they are 100% dedicated to just building that a, a similar outer coating for lighting. I mean, that's the kind of passion we put behind it. We don't take anything off the shelf. Every piece of it is thought out and designed. Our RCA plugs are not bought off the shelf. Everybody thinks we buy them. We have our own part number manufactured with a specific specification on that plug. I mean, it's those details. I remember my grandfather saying, you, you just don't, don't, don't just do something to do it. If you're going to do it, make it work all the time. And so 3 stainless, we don't use the cheaper stainless. We use the highest grade stainless. Some of our new parts are made out of titanium. Um, so you, you start at the fiberglass pole and, and you build that fiberglass and you strand, we strand our own wires. Then we build our, our boards aren't made, um, specifically, in our plant, but they're made for us under our engineering specs. So we took the whole board apart, all the chips apart, everything, and sat down with a complete engineering team to build that, that outer coating, 100% proprietary to us. The only company in the world can do it. We use an aluminum cap. We get that all the time. Why don't you guys just do a cheaper part? It's it's about the fit and finish. Everything has to come together. So it's 316 stainless on the bottom, 6061 billet aluminum top. It's UV resistant. I have to tell you 25 years, but it's life. You can leave that product sit in the sun and it won't yellow. Take our competitor's product, leave it in the sun for two days, come back and leave ours. Ours will almost be clearer and theirs will yellow because it's a PVC-based coating versus a foley polymer-based coating. They're two totally different kinds of structures and molecules um, and how they work and how they come together. It's, the, it's a very similar technology to like PEX pipe. You, know, you can heat it, form it, and move it. It's very similar technology to that. Yeah, it's, it's definitely something unique because <clears throat> you can be, you know, see multiple cars next to each other. And even with the lights off, you can see that the buggy is clearer and it's because of that coating, right? And that coating does multiple things beyond protecting the chips. It also protects, you know, the lifespan of the product. It, it, it protects the light throughput of the product. Um, all those things all add up to being a top shelf product, right? Um, and so something that's interesting that I've heard being kind of like an argument to the, to the buggy whip is the way they mount. Right. And you said you guys stay in, you stay in steel or whatever, or not whatever. I'm not throwing that off, but the, the, you use stainless steel, it's, it's a CNC part or a, a lathe part, right? 
Um, right. And it, it's it's not the typical mount. Normally, what you'll see with a with a whip manufacturer is they use kind of a bulk made either cast or uh, quickly CNC'd aluminum part that has a slot for a wire that comes out of it that goes to a PC board that then that does you know XYZ connections and all these different things that are all off sure. the shelf Alibaba parts that anybody and that's why we see so many whip companies right is that anybody can go online buy in bulk and then all of a sudden they have a thousand whips for sale right um but there's a difference there because these some of the arguments that i've heard is well they don't have a spring base they don't have these other like pin options or or whatever or whatever the case of the argument is but the idea being they don't mount in a way that would save the whip in the case of an impact and my thought was why would you need to save it in the case of an impact if it doesn't break I mean, is that kind of your thought? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the spring option, it, you know, I've actually had, and I won't say who it is or what manufacturer is, but I've actually had a customer that multiple customers that have broke tabs off of their car because the whip is so strong. And I've had cage manufacturers and vehicle manufacturers call the customer and say, well, you should just buy a cheaper whip. <laughs> it's, it's stunning to me, but Yes. Is everything breakable? Sure. You put a 3,500 pound car on a piece of fiberglass, it's breakable, right? But we do everything in our power to make that not. And I think you see the Dune and Destroy videos when we were up in Oregon and we were hitting trees as hard as we could and not breaking the whip. Sure. If you hit it an inch off the base, there's no flex to it, right? But it's it's that con it goes back to fiberglass, right? It's the combination of having flexibility with strength. How can you take our eight foot whip completely bend it into you yet have it stand straight on virtually straight up at 150 miles an hour with a three by five flag on it goes back to that baseline, right? It's about the molecule structure in that fully polymer. It's about the fiberglass, right? It's those little details. It's the science behind it that makes it do that stuff. There's there, the spring argument becomes an interesting argument. It, 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 it's like if you, I mean, this is a horrible example. I mean, I'm not good at examples. So, I'll <laughs> this one anyways, but it's like you drive a Honda Elantra with 15 inch rims on it. You got something against Honda here. We gotta, we gotta sort this out afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of Honda stories, but the it's like you drive a Honda Elantra with with 15 inch tires, and then you call Ferrari and you go, I don't understand why you don't have 15 inch tires. You're like, well, wait, it's a totally different car. There's these wheels are designed to go 200 miles an hour. It's this, it's that. Yeah, but I don't understand why you don't run 15 inch tires, right? The reason our competitor runs a spring is because the product won't hold up because they're baseline, right? They're probably buying, you know, I, I don't know this for a fact, but most of them are probably buying like a fire stick, for example, which is a CB antenna is what it is, right? They're buying that and they're wrapping the leads around it, or they're getting a base out of overseas or wherever it's coming from. And you can't compare one thing, right? I think that's what happens a lot of times is in, in this goes back to pricing and parts and that is that somebody goes, well, yeah, but it was only this much on my motorcycle. Why is it this much more on a UTV, right? And 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 we get in this mind thought, I do too, where you start comparing things that you used to have to things today, right? The product is built to withstand what you can throw at it. Is everything breakable? A hundred percent, right? And we'll do everything we can to get you a good price if you break it, right? But the reality of it is, is that the product is strong enough that you don't need a spring. You're more likely going to break a tree branch or a tab on the car before you're going to break the whip. And, and it goes kind of like into a windshield. We've been talking about cars. It goes into like a windshield, right? Like you can get a cheap windshield and you sneeze on it too hard. It'll crack, right? You can get a high quality windshield with all the safety features and everything built into it. And it's going to withstand impacts for the most part for anything you throw at it, driving it in the right. city, driving it on the highway, driving it off road. And then inevitably there is a scenario where a semi throws a big chunk of concrete at your window and it breaks. Like it's just going to happen, but you, sure. but you have a windshield that lasted you 25 years and had right. no problems until that moment in time. Right? Like you didn't complain to the manufacturer of the windshield that it broke. It did its job. It did it, it 100%. Just, at one point eventually succumbed to a force that was greater than its own. Well, and I think, I think that's the, but you wouldn't compare your, your, your $99 windshield to your $500 windshield, but that's what happens. Right. And, and that's the interesting thing about the whip industry. 
the the greatest thing about the whip industry is it's the one industry anybody can build a whip i'll be the first person to say it right it, it's it's not rocket science do we take it the engineering of it to a whole nother level that most people don't and spend millions of dollars doing it yes we do but anybody can build a whip with that statement being said everybody thinks because they can build a whip all whips are the same right and and so there's a lesser value put on whips because of that right almost every whip company out there and and i can't say this with 100 percent, but most whip companies out there are a creation because they had problems with somebody else's whip right you know, whoever it was, Joe's brand didn't like Bob's brand. So he built slightly better. And then, uh, you know, Scott built one better than Joe. And that's the cool thing about the whip industry. But just because that's the neat thing about it doesn't mean that all whips are created equal. And I think that's where, where we have to take a step back and really look at this because that's what's happening in the whip industry. You can't go out and create a car right? You can't go out and build your own car for the most part. Most people can't. Sure. Can you? Yeah, you can buy it, but they don't Unless have you're Elon Musk and then it's no problem. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But you know, most people can't build their own thing. So they, they don't put a value on it. Right. But when you can build your own stuff, people put a value on it. Right. But what they don't understand is technology. I mean, this goes back to somewhat a, a pro Eagle is a great friend of mine and, and Chuck over at pro Eagle. That Jack is amazing, right? Not to get off subject, but Everybody goes, yeah, but I can go to Harbor Freight and I can put big wheels on it and I can put a skid play on it and I have a jack. So they don't put value in a Pro Eagle jack. But what you don't understand is look at the pump, look at the diameter, look at the thickness of the walls, look at all that other engineering that goes into that jack that Harbor Freight isn't putting into theirs, right? Yeah, yes, it's a jack. Yes, it goes up and down, but it's not the same jack. It this has a stand that holds it, you know, it's got a mount that holds it in place so that you're not stocking blocks of wood. I mean, we've seen the videos where somebody stacks a block of wood and the car goes sliding off of it, right? But it's it's that same concept where people don't put value behind it because they can build it themselves. If you want to build your own whip, that's awesome. But that doesn't mean that our whip is the same, right? And and I don't I don't want that to sound, you know, jerkish or whatever but it's it's not right there's engineering and there's thought that goes behind it because we don't ever want it to fail i, I tell people this all the time i don't want to hear from you again it's not that i don't want to be <laughs> your friend or talk to you i just don't want you calling me with a problem right if you want to call me and go dude let's go hang out or let's just i'm up for that but to 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 have these things in place where it's like you have to fix problems all the time just doesn't make sense to me and kind of on that same subject that's why I'm a terrible businessman as far as springs are concerned. We don't, I don't believe in selling a customer product just to sell it. We, we have quote unquote day whips or whatever you want to call it. But all the time people call and I go, why would you do that? Sure. Could I sell them a $90 part and, and make more money? Absolutely. But that's a waste of money for the customer. I don't want to do that. I don't know what your budget is, but why? And, and to me, when you talk about springs and you talk about losses, it, it's because they're fed misinformation to sell more parts, right? And to me, that takes away from the customer experience. I'd rather sell you the part you need and only sell you what you need so you're happy. And this goes into the same thing with our dealers. We get asked all the time, why don't you guys have a minimum buy-in for dealers? Because the last thing I want to do is make you buy a minimum amount of products to then find it doesn't work for your customers, right? If your customer base doesn't like us, then don't buy in. But if your customer, I'd rather sell you one and go, wow, that really worked. And then sell you two and three. And then you go, wow, this product really works. I can sell it to my customer. So let's do that. If, if that makes sense in a way. Yeah. And there's, when you, when you force the buy-in, you also force the sale, right? Like if you're going to having the inventory sitting there, you're, you're in a position where you feel like you have to move that inventory no matter who it is. And it might not be the right product for that person. There's, you know, scenarios where there's, there's motorsports quads and whatever is that don't have charging systems that can support a huge lit whip. Right. And, and so there's a, there's a place for a day whip, a fire, a dry whip was what I call it. The, the idea right. that this, this thing doesn't consume power. There's a place for that in, in the sport, but at the same time, we should be giving uh, the option for, for the purchaser to buy the right product, not being force fed from the dealer. How many times have we gone to the dealer 
and they force an accessory, they force a package, they force a, a whatever because that's their agenda, right? Like it's not because it's the best solution for you. It's because that's what they've put stock in. That's what they've put their investment in. And so now they have to return that investment. And it doesn't matter who that person that buys it is. It's just the, the cycle that they're in. And there's a place for that in a dealership where you need to do integration points and you need to do aftermarket upgrades and things like that that are authorized by the manufacturers and blah, 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 blah. But at the same time, if you're looking for the best solution for something, you should have the incentive to do so based off of the proof in the product, not based off of some salesman's gimmick push or trickery. Right. Don't add add-ons just to add add-ons. I mean, it's great for making the overall company look good. But if you don't need it, I don't want to sell it to you. I have every spring whip mount you could imagine, right? But all the time people call here and then they're like, oh, after talking to you, I realize I don't need that. You don't. So don't buy it. I'd love to sell it to you. Sure. Why not? Let me sell it to you. But what does that do? It doesn't do anything other than put a bad taste in the customer's mouth. And we, we've we talked about it a little bit before. But, you know, it there's 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 a position of we're going to sell this product because people will buy it, which is fine. That's business sense like 101, right? Right. But at the same time, if you already have the better solution, focus on getting that one to the person's hands versus just these other things that ultimately will lead them to buying that thing, right? Like right. It's, it's more of a good faith. It's a more of a, a, a moral uh, type judgment on the business owner side to say, I, I value you as a customer more than that. And I'm willing to wait for you to come around to my side and buy into that product, right? Like there's going to be the person that is going to be hesitant. There's going to be the person that's going to like, I, I enjoy buying things and testing things, knowing that inevitably I'm going to get to a certain point, but I got to that point knowing <laughs> that I got there for a reason. Like right. there, there's radios. I have a whole bunch of different brands of radios. Like I've gone through the process of the cheapest one, the middle one, the higher end one to get to a point of saying, yeah, I now know why I'm going to say what I'm going to say about recommending that product. Right. right. But I'm a unique case. That's me. That's my personality. That's what I do for like kind of like my living is like, I learn right. and I exponentiate that information back. But for a consumer that is not going to do that, they need to be educated by the people selling them that thing. So there's going to be a market where the customer's solution is a dancing fancy whip because they're just in the mud. They don't go more than five miles an hour and they don't go more than an, a mile at a time on a trip or whatever the case is. But if you're out riding and you are looking for safety, then you need to have a product that provides the safety factor. And that's what I think we've proven kind of over the last 45 minutes about safety and why something's better than something else. And I was thinking about what you said a little bit ago about the quality of the upright, right? The fiberglass, the whatever, the flex, the whatever. There's a part of this that we don't think about, and that's the object in motion, right? When you have a flag on there and you're at high speed, that whip, if you go out to the, any trails, any dunes, and you see somebody at high speed, that whip is typically at like a 35, 45 degree angle or more if it's an inferior product with a big flag on it, right? They're way over, right? So, the, if you go to a dune or recreational area where they're saying you have to have an eight foot height minimum for your flag or a nine foot or a 10 foot or whatever, and it has to be on the front or the back or whatever. The reason they're saying that is because in our topography, to be seen safely, you have to reach a certain height at a certain angle, right? right? When your car's pitched up at a 25, 35 degree angle in dune or whatever, your flag is going to then not be as tall. It's going to deflect over because you're at an angle. And then if you add to that speed and resistance on the flag, all of a sudden you're horizontal with your flag, right? And all of a right. sudden you're no longer seen, right? That's that's kind 100%. of a, a big deal. So n negating the LED factor, negating the, the 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 dollar factor, and all these different things, right? If you're, and, and I know we're specifically just hampering on this like whip safety thing, but that's who you are, right? Like that's what we're talking about. So, so to continue down that path, um, if your whip is at a horizontal plane or close to it, it does you absolutely zero good being safe, right? Like you're not going to gain any safety from that. You're just meeting a minimum requirement to go play. Right. And so now you're no longer valuing the contents of that vehicle and you're no longer valuing the contents of that other person's vehicle. You're negating that. You're saying it doesn't matter. And in my opinion, that's irresponsible and a moral judgment that I think a lot of people don't correctly make. And 
there's there's times to have big flags and to be to be a little bit peacock about your car and your brand and all that stuff. I get it. Like everybody has their time and place for that. But I don't think that should be when you're out actually running, right? Like if you're running, you need to be safe and you need to be safe for you, but you need to be safe for others. And if they can't see your whip because you have an inferior product because it's laying on your exhaust, that's a big deal to me. I'm not going to be safe when you come around the corner or over the dune or whatever. Like, right. It's important to me that everyone else is educated on the idea that it this is way more than a dollar discussion, right? This is a, this is a safety discussion, and I think we've driven that home so far. But there's so many aspects of safety that we all just need to be aware of. Yeah, I agree, and, and I think you hit on something too a while back talking about the dancing whip and if you're in the mud. But but there's the safety aspect which we've driven home, and and, and it's a huge factor, and I think most people would agree with that the but think about the purpose of what a whip is outside of that when you're at camp how do you light up camp for your barbecue you turn you turn your generator on in your trailer you drain your batteries by putting a light out well those color changing whips right they're not bright enough you can't get enough chipsets you can't create a, a valid enough piece to put enough light out that it shines your whole camp well Think about that. You could put a whip on your car, pull it up in camp, and now you could play kids. You could play um, uh, different games. You could have things going on. You could. There's all kinds of other purposes for the whip beyond just the safety aspect, right? That's the main purpose for buying it. But what happens when you want to barbecue or you want to cook or you want to hang out or you want to have light at the campfire? You're at the hill, right? How many times at the hill, a prime example, going back to safety, but you're at the hill sitting on top of the hill and people are jumping or coming down or coming over or whatever at night. Well, if you have a whip that's bright enough that shines your entire car plus a 30 to 50 foot radius around you, guess what you have? A safe zone where somebody's going to see you in the instant. But if you don't have that or you have your daytime whip on or or you have one that's not bright enough, what do you what do you have? You you don't have that safety zone at night when you're out hanging out with your friends. And I think that is kind of like um, a side effect of a quality designed product, right? Like you're going to have things that benefit from it outside of the intended focus zone, right? Like you're right. saying that this this whip is a safety thing while you're riding your car, but it's also a safety thing. It's also an auxiliary thing that benefits you because it's so well engineered that it has these other side effects. And I think like if we look back, there's a there's a picture that we've showed a number of times and I'll overlay it on the video if you're watching. Um of our Idaho BDR run where we arrived to, you know, a campsite in the middle of nowhere at like 8,000 elevation with, with like six cars or whatever it was. I think it was six or seven cars um, to a campground in the middle of the night. It was like 1130 at night. There was no sunlight to set up camp. There was no like the way that everything was situated. You couldn't just turn on your headlights and light up camp. Like it was just kind of like a fishbowl of everybody in the middle of this spot with a bunch of trees around you with no light and you know Ian turned on his buggy whips and another car turned on their buggy whips and all of a sudden the entire lake and campground was lit up <laughs> and so we had people right. you could hear people waking up and rustling around because it was like we brought the sun with us and we now had the ability to set up camp start our fire get our cars prepped get food out you know do all those things based off a couple whips which a lot of people will say yeah I can turn my whips on I got I got these RGB whips or whatever, I can turn them on to white and do the same thing. It's like, well, until you've experienced it, like in, if you've <laughs> seen it in practice, you don't understand the difference. It's a big difference. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I, and I, and that, that just comes from, that's the, that's the really cool thing about whips that I got to experience is because we've been in this so long. I mean, we've been in it 55 years, the oldest company in the world at building whips, the oldest what's amazing is you think about where whips came from right so we started with safety with the fiberglass and you could run a flag and all that and most of these laws out there were based upon our product right that's why you have to run a red flag that's why there's these rules is because there was us that was it right and now as overseas market and people are able to get product easier there's companies that have been created off of that um with that being said though there's so many auxiliary and applications we're finding with racing and motorsports and mining and construction, all these new areas, boats and all this stuff that nobody's even thought of before 
that's opening the doors for opportunities. You know, we, uh, you know, and it comes back to why do you make the product so indestructible? Why do you do this stuff? We were at a show once and they burn $400,000 a year on fluorescent bulbs inside this machine that has this wheel that spins to fix railroad tracks. I'm not even joking when wow. I tell the story. And they took our whips, they mounted it inside this machine, and all of a sudden they saved themselves hundreds of thousands of dollars a year because they didn't have to buy product anymore. I mean, there's so many applications that the whip is useful for. It's endless that you can use it. I was uh, I was looking at a guy's rig uh, a little while back, and I was like, man, your car's underglow is the brightest underglow I have ever seen on a car. <laughs> I was like, what pods are you using? What rock lights are you using? He's like, bro, I got two buggy whips, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Darren Parsons did it turned out rad. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He did it on his on his uh, what was his, his uh, truck. truck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty rad to see see that happen. And, and I was, you know, if you've ever seen a buggy whip booth at a, at a show, you know that they they bring out all their colored whips, all the colors of their whips and all that stuff and put them out on the on for display. And it's kind of it's kind of a bummer that most shows kind of close down at the end of the day, because like once the sun goes down, <laughs> all of a sudden you just like holy crap, what is like glowing over there? And it's the buggy whip booth because their whips are just like <laughs> burning the sun right into everybody's retinas. Um, but it's yeah. pretty cool. It shows talking about that when we were up, uh, you and I were talking at uh, takeover in Utah and where my trailer was parked. Every person that came back, came to our booth the next day and said, that's how I found my way home was your trailer. <laughs> Cause you left whips on all night. Every event it happens, whether it's hammers or whatever, people go, you know, I found my way home was the whips, right? So we're kind of like the North Star. We're just leading people <laughs> home, right way back to back to safety. Yeah, I mean, talking about some of the auxiliary uses for for the whips, I mean, a lot of people don't understand that base camp, if you put a whip at base camp up on a, on top of the trailer or the pole or whatever, it makes it so much easier to get back to camp. Like if you're out on the if you're out on the dunes or or whatever out in the desert knowing exactly where you're at and at least having like you said a north star to kind of guide your your path direction like me i'm kind of a, a a maps guy like i'm gonna follow my trails if i if i'm going back somewhere i'm gonna follow back where i came unless there's a better right. option like that's the kind of approach i have but a lot of guys just go out they don't have mapping software if they have to pull out their phone out they're just hoping the internet works and like they're good but right but to get home sometimes when you're desert riding or when you're in the dunes or whatever a lot of times it comes down to knowing approximately where you're going versus exactly where you're going. And a lot of times having a simple whip on top of your uh, camper or, or, or whatever can make a huge difference in that way. Um, Agreed. I mean, the auxiliary lighting, getting back to that, when you talk about situation happening, whether it's a belt breaking or just a part in general breaking or part failure or whatever, with our whips, it's enough light that you can work on it. You can, you have light, right? You don't have to get a, carry an extra flashlight or carry something. You can do all of it with just the whips being lit. And what, what when are we going to see the the buggy whip lifesavers? I know uh, uh, Wilkie had a, a unique little scenario where he had some mobile <laughs> buggy whips. When can we see the the, the portable buggy whip scenario? Uh, there is some out there. <laughs> you know, there's been this on running joke that, and I tried to get Sand Sports to do it this year, where we wanted to make them lightsabers and have kids uh, go and pretend to be Star Wars characters and fight <laughs> each other inside the booth. But we have not gotten approval for that yet. But hopefully here in the near future, we will we will make dreams a reality. <laughs> Something about kids whacking people with sticks in a public setting is, <laughs> is a little bit off-putting to an insurance agency, I think. Yeah, um, they didn't like it. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I just... Over the last week, I've had some ideas in my head. I'm going to talk to you afterwards, but, okay. um, but uh, yeah, I think it's been a good conversation about you know why this in, this part of the industry is unique and and the idea that we just have to have a focus on what really matters and what really actually the reason we're doing certain purchases, why they exist, and 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 it's not just the bling factor. Like there's a reason certain things exist because there's certain needs to be fulfilled. And a lot of that comes down to safety. A lot of that comes down to um, knowledge and the idea that you know where something is or where you're going or, or whatever the case is. Um, and I think we just often over time look way past that. Like we've talked about the med kits. We've talked about, you know, just all these different things of safety that should be inherently default in our sport, but is not. And right. um, it's super important when we talk about uh, purchasing a product that is going to advertise that safety that we really consider the 
turn around on that promise and if it's actually going to do that for us in practice, not just in the sales pitch. So I appreciate yeah. you uh, taking the time out of your busy day to, um, to I, I mean, we had to nail down uh, a couple of times to get you on the show. So you're, you're a busy guy and I appreciate your time and, and, and knowledge. I mean, Absolutely. this is, you know, this is not just somebody that started a whip company over the last few years as the industry got hot, right? This is a, a company right. that focuses on this particular issue, safety, visibility, and they have a top shelf product that then can promise that in reality, not just in the sales pitch. And I appreciate both your time and willingness to come talk about it with us. I appreciate your time to talk with me off the air and all the things that we've talked about. Um, and I appreciate the quality and the dedication to that quality in your product. I, and and I just, I can't thank you enough for, for your time, obviously on and off the air and in this show. And, uh, you know, we're available call us anytime, you know, that's, that's a big thing for customers, you know, call us, ask us questions, you know, if the product's not the right fit for you, we're going to tell you, we just want to be upfront with people who want to be honest. And we want to bring a product that will do what we say it's going to do. And that's the goal at the end of the day is keep you safe, keep you having fun and, and really take the steps to engineer something that, that just nobody else has pushed in the limits to get there to. There, there's an influx of people willing to participate in the manufacturing of goods in this industry because this industry is exploding. We have a lack of manufacturers in this industry that are dedicated to fulfilling a promise that matters and at the same time doing it in the United States, doing it here on our home to soil and not sending that money overseas. I think is a huge deal that a lot of us like to say we support, but we don't do it in action. And so I think that's a, a big deal. And I think with the with the way that the world's been over the last, you know, few years, there's an, a renewed emphasis on that and that we should be taking just as much as we dedicate to our community, we should be dedicating to our country in that aspect as well. Our economies, our local economies, our local brands, our local mom and pops, um, right. you know, with the globalization of everything, it's it's more and more important to support each other in our own business and endeavors. Um, but I think it's important that we focus on the idea that, we need to to reiterate the promise and the and the safety and the the follow through on those products. So I appreciate you you guys doing that, and I appreciate your time to explain that. Uh, we'll probably have you on again for for other shows and other things that we do, and we've we've we've, we've talked about other conversations that we may yeah. or may not have on the air. So <laughs> um, I, I I'm totally stoked on the future, obviously, of our sport. I'm, I'm stoked on the future of quality manufacturing and, and products and, and fulfilling those promises. Um, where can people find out more about the brand, the products? Uh, where can they find you on social? Uh, where can they get educated on the entire product set and, and other things? Uh, buggywhip.com. And if you go to our website, it's Buggy Whip Inc. On, on Instagram, on Facebook, social media platforms, YouTube. Uh, but if you go to buggywhip.com, we have all the data there. So we don't hide anything. We break down how the molecules work. We break down the lumen output. We break down every inch of it. That is the difference between us and our competitors is we don't stand and say, we're the brightest, we're the best, we're this. We show you. If you go to our Instagram, you can see many of our athletes, some of them crashing, rolling, flipping, whatever it is. You can see the high horsepower cars. You can see those individuals that run the product and see how the product actually works, not just me telling you. And then you can go to the website and see the actual molecule structure, how it's produced, how it's made, actual facts behind it. I don't want to say we're the brightest. I want to put the facts out there and then you can see it for yourself. And I think you would see it, you know, out in the industry as well. You can pretty much identify a car with the buggy yeah. bought it. So, yeah. um, like I said, from a crowd of a thousand people, you can pretty much identify every single one of them. Um, so, uh, thanks for tuning into the show. You can find us on iP iTunes or it's called Apple Podcast now. You can find us on uh, Google Play. You can find us on uh, Spotify, iHeartRadio, all those different places. If you want to watch the show, if you want to see Russ's lovely face and uh, beautiful locks <laughs> of hair, uh, you can do that on uh, YouTube as well. Um, you can find all the information at buggywhips.com. You can find them online. You can find their products in practice on the dunes or in the trails brighter than the sun. Uh, and so we look forward to seeing these products more. Uh, we look forward to seeing, you know, maybe some new things around the corner and, uh, we can't wait to see you out on the show circuit too. Um, and, uh, I can't wait for you to make the t-shirt the that says, I never want to hear from you again. So <laughs> until next time, guys, enjoy peace. <laughs>